We will now move on to the next Chai Pakora Adda with Daniel Levente Pal, who will be reading us some of his poems in Hungarian and their translation by Paul Sohar. Um, and the reading will be followed by a conversation moderated by Tara Kandelwal. Daniel Levente Pal is a poet, writer, editor, circus dramaturge. He's the author of four poetry books and two collections of short stories. His books and writings have been translated into English, German, Portuguese, Spanish, Serbian, Roma Romanian, Arabic, Turkish, Chinese, and Thai. Since January 2016, he has worked for the Capital Circus of Budapest. He is the recipient of scholarship of Institute uh, Camo Portugal, award medal of the Hungarian Association of Special Education, special prize of the 13th International Circus Festival of, of Budapest. Te vagy a nyelvem, ami idegen. Kókusztejet ittunk. A karcolt ablakon át üres városok nyugodt tekintete bágyott a kora reggeli afrikai ködben. Elvesztettem, és újra megtaláltam itt azt a könnyed férfi hangot, ami felkapja az üzletek előtt a járdán összegyűlt sárga homokot, ami nem ülepszik a csésze aljára, ami megáll a száraz pálma leveleken. Te vagy a hangom, a nyelvem, ujjaim a billentyűzeten, vagy a tollat fogó kéz. Te vagy, ami remeg a síneken, görcsös betűkkel írja jobbra, sorsát balról, Alexandria felé a vonaton. Te vagy a nyelvem, ami idegen. Napokig hallgató hangom az ujjaim ahogy a te szavaiddal hozzád írnak visszaolvashatatlan európai szavakat. Azt a szép vallomást gondolom kettőn közé, amit leírni már nem tudok, amire már se fülem, se nyelvem. Kiköpöm a port felét, ki az ablakon vagy a nyitott kocsi ajtón. Kiköpöm, gondolom. Mégis csócsálom órákon át, mézbe ragadt fogaim között, mosolyogsz az én mosolyommal. Tolvaj, mondanám, de a szégyen, hogy mondva is a te hangodat hallom, visszatart. Elnyesi a hangszálaimat. Alszol, te drága tolvajom. Nézlek tág pupillával egyszerre fentről és lentről. Sóhajomat elnyeri a homok. Szeretnék egy nyelvet megtanulni, amit nem értesz, amit nem tudsz. Buján, füledbe, súgni, lápossa izzadt matracon. Egy nyelvet, ami az enyém, amin kisajátíthatlak. Magamévá tehetlek, amin újra birtokba vehetlek. Idegen nyelvemmel nyelvedet érhettem. Ráharapatok, számba szívhatom. Újra megtalált törékeny békémbe és leharaphatom tőlem lopott kacér nyelvedet, édes új nyelvem huszonkét tejfogával, és rákhatom szemedbe hosszan belenézve, sóhajot csorgatva az utcakövekre, amíg méz édessé nem keveredik mosolyom fűszerével, és nyelhetem vissza, amit enyémnek tudtam, és most újra enyém, büszkén a szerzéstől ködve távolodó elvesztett veled. Nyelved, Zsákmányom, viszem Alexandria felé. Ölemben óvom, elaludni nem lehet, tengerbe merítem majd a lelkedet. Túlparton Európa, ez itt nem az, égő gumiszaporítja a habzóvizeket. Innen nézlek, nagyon messze az a sziklafal. Leülök a homokba, ezer kavicsra kötöm, ezer darabra tépet viruló emléket foszlányait, Kipattintom a sört, rágyújtok. Szegényes rétusok egy behúnyt szemű pillanat, 50 méter távolságból látom magam, aprónak, ahogy láthatonnan távcsövével nagyítás nélkül az a vörös német és fekete barátnőjét. A lényeg most ezer darabra tört szép emléked, és az ezer kavics, vidáman dobálom a szembesüvítő sós széllel, bele a pillanatig legnagyobb hullámokba, amíg karom bírja mert a felejtés is erőfeszítés férfi munka, és egyedül a legkisebb porszemet is határozottan nehezebb odébb címteni, mint testvérrel, baráttal, harsány férfi társasággal. Hát még egy lapos, tengeri kavicsot elhajítani ügyetlen erővel. 
nem is bírtam soká, talán ha kétszázat szét haigáltam, ledöltem szuszogva, jobbkarom masszírozva, és néztem egy sirály. Mi más nézhettem volna? Egy gumifös, füstös, mesztelen alexandriai égdarabban. És néztem azt a sirályt, közel 800 kőből emelt fészken biztonságából, szinte belőle, ahogy már támaszkodni és gyönge karom dörgöltem. Kicsit sem büszkén, pláne emelt fővel. Inkább valami bódult melankólia, mint az égű gumi füstje súlya alatt, hogy fel kéne állnom, kivennem egy olcsó szobát valahol, holnap visszajönnem, folytatni befejezetlen nagy felejtés munkám, és bízva abban, számba véve azt is, mint lehetőséget, hogy az ellenem fújó, szembehabzó tenger, ezer kavicsom, széttépet emlékeit, újra partra mossa, eszembe idéz. It's the end of the Hungarian poem that I read it in English. Yusita? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Yes. We drank coconut milk through the scratched up window. The calm countenance of empty cities seemed to be languishing in the early morning African fog. I'd lost and found it again here, a casual male voice that can stir up the yellow sand gathering on the sidewalk in front of stores and settling not to the bottom of teacups but on dry palm leaves for God. You are my tongue, my voice, my fingers on the keyboard, and the hand holding a pen. You are what shimmers on the tracks, scribbles my fate from left to right, on the train to Alexandria. You are my tongue that's foreign to me, my voice that stays silent for days, my fingers as they write back to you in your words, illegible European words. I fancy that beautiful confession between the two of us, the one I can no longer write down, the one for which I have neither ears nor tongue. I spit the dust out toward you, out the window, out the open door of the railroad car. I spit it out, I believe, yet I keep munching in, uh, yet I keep munching on it for hours between my honey glued teeth. You are smiling with my smile. Thief, I like to say, but what I say is what I hear in your voice. And, this, and the shame of it holds me back, snips my vocal cords. You are asleep, my beloved teeth. I'm watching you with dilated pupils from above and below all at once. The sand swallows up my sides. I'd like to learn a language that you can't understand, can't speak to whisper it senselessly in your ears on a mattress turned to swamp by sweet, in a language that's all mine, in which I can expropriate you, make you all mine, in which I can make you my, pro make you my property. With my foreign tongue, I can, I can touch your tongue, bite into it, suck it into my mouth, into my newly recovered fragile piece and bite off your seductive tongue stolen from me, my sweet new tongue with its 22 baby teeth and I can chew it, looking deep and long into your eyes, dribbling your sides on the cobblestones until they turn honey sweet mixed with the spices of my smile and I can again swallow what I used to know as mine, and what is mine anew, proud of the gain, receding in the fog with the lost of you, with the lost you. 
taking your tongue, I blunder toward Alexandria, protecting it in my lap, depriving myself of sleep. I dunk your soul in the sea. On the other side is Europe. Here it's something else. The smell of burning rubber covers the foamy waves. It's from there I watch you. The cliff is very far. I sit down in the sand. I take a thousand pebbles and I tie them to the petals of your blooming memory now ripped to a thousand pieces. I snap the top of a beer bottle, light up cigarette, poor man's rituals, rituals. A moment with its eyes shut, I see myself from the distance of my 50 meters. Smellish the way I can see from the same distance by the red German tourist and his black girlfriend with a telescope without magnification. The main thing now is your memory broken into a thousand pieces and the thousand pebbles I merrily toss into the salty wind roaring at me into the biggest wave of the moment so long as my arm can move. Because forgetting, because forgetting too, because forgetting too requires effort. It's a man's job. And even the smallest grain of sand is harder to flick a little over by oneself than with the help of a brother, a friend, boisterous company of men, how much harder it is to toss a flat sea pebble with inert force. And of course, I couldn't keep it up very long. Maybe I managed to scatter 200. I lay down out of breath, massaging my right arm and watching a seagull. What, a, what else was there to watch in that rubber smoked naked piece of, piece of sky in Alexandria? And I, was, and I was watching that seagull from the security of my nest built out of 800 stones watching almost from your eyes, although I had to keep rubbing my weak arm even while leaning on something, not at all proudly and not with head held high under the weight of melancholy rather than the smoke of the burning rubber. Yet it's time for me to stand up, rent a cheap room somewhere, and come back tomorrow to go on with my unfinished work of forgetting, hoping for, hoping for and taking into account the possibility of the sea blowing straight at me, sending such sea waves in my, face, in my face that will wash my thousand pebbles ashore again with your ripped up memory reminding me of you. Thank you. Hello, Daniel. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, it was very, very beautiful. And I've really enjoyed reading your poetry and your short stories. So, Thank you. Um, you know, why don't we begin with you telling us a little bit more about the poem you just read. I love the way that it dealt with, you know, uh, the whole theme of forgetting and how difficult it is to forget. Um, so where did that poem come from? Uh, from my life. I usually work from my life. Uh, it's, uh, it's in Europe, it's a normal poetic uh, situation to write a poem. Use your life as uh, material. Uh, this was my first honeymoon and the story of my first honeymoon it was in uh, 211, no, 200, the January of 200, no, the end of 211, December, and the first days of January. I think we, we went to Alexandria maybe, maybe after, uh, maybe the first days of January, never mind. And, um, and it's uh, very strange, but I have the intention or that uh, 
that this uh, marriage isn't work. I write the poem on the train going back to Alexandria, okay. then go, go, going to Alexandria and going back to Cairo. It was just writing, writing, writing on my notebook. Then a month later, she, she moved from my flat and, and the marriage ended. Right. And later, I, I have this poem in my memories and re read it again. And yes, I knew everything. Wow. I have the feeling about the, this marriage isn't work. In the middle of honeymoon. <laughs> wow, that's quite a story. And, you know, our subconscious knows more than we would ever know. Um, and the poem really captured that sense of... Uh, you know, falling in love and then the sense of loss and how difficult it is uh, to get over something and how difficult it is to forget. So I th thought that you did it really well. Um, I was very, yes, very... Yes, and you know, you know, there are some, some metaphors with the, with the pebbles or yes. little, small, little stones on the shore. And there's the game, the throwing the stones in, yes. the, in the ocean or the wave of the sea. And every child make it and it's it could be funny yeah. then uh, if if it's a metaphor of memories that you throw a memory away to the common right. sea of all the memories of humankind but the sea and the waves uh, do something against you right and the other day you you find you can find again your memories on the show and this is a really sad thing because you uh, there are some memories you cannot forget correct yeah that metaphor just really just the pebbles metaphor really described it very very well um, I was very fascinated with, um, you know, your resume, the amount of work you've done across formats. You've written uh, four poetry collections, a book of short stories. You've been an editor at uh, the biggest university publishing houses and literary magazines. And now you work as a playwright dramaturge for the capital circus of Budapest. Um, you know, what a what a very varied interest, uh, so much creativity, but I want to go right back to the beginning. Um, I'm always <laughs> interested in writers, origin stories. You know, where did it all start? Where did this fascination with storytelling, with words begin? Uh, what were some of your first, what, what were some of your first stories that you wrote? Yes, I cannot control myself. I have so many, I had so many roles, just editor or journalist or dramaturg or actor or dancer in my life. I don't know why, but uh, I have childhood memories uh, from the time uh, when I couldn't even couldn't even write and did uh, and I dictated my poems, my childhood poems to my grandmother from the age of I don't know three or four. I recently moved into another apartment, and these texts came out of the death of a chest. And uh, my grandmother hasn't lived for almost twenty years. And with her beautiful handwriting, these child poems have survived about monkeys, jungle, <laughs> expeditions, childish things. But it was really nostalgic and kind of funny because I think uh, I think somewhere there was a kind of beginning without the ability of writing. I have the necessity necessity to write poems or uh, to to make the world in my with my words. Right, it was just something that was part of you uh, that that had to be expressed, and that's so wonderful. Um, you know, it's also very interesting. You've studied across disciplines. You've studied linguistics to theater, theater theory to philosophy to Arabic. Um, I'm a big fan of interdis getting an interdisciplinary sort of perspective. So how is this interdisciplinary education contributed to your work when it comes to your poetry and your fiction? I'm interested in everything. 
just like a sponge. <laughs> you know, the Long Island iced tea, the cocktail. And the, what is Long Island iced tea? Everything you have in the bar, just put in a glass. Alcohol and Coke and ice and more alcohol, more alcohol. And I think my the almost 10 years, decade of my university and PhD studies was just like uh, Long Island iced tea. I interested in philosophy, yes, then Arabic, yes, then I finished the Portuguese literature, then I started to be a teacher, then I, I reached a theater group, group, then I lost the connection with them, then I became a, a contemporary dancer, and uh, that time, that long, long decade, but just like, uh, I don't know, I don't know what, uh, with what purpose, I don't know with what aim, but I'm interested in everything. And in my poetry and so many poems, I mean, use all these experiences. And uh, yes, uh, I think it's, uh, you have, you have a diploma or you finish a university. It's a great thing uh, if you search a, a, a workplace or <laughs> search a profession or to earn, earn normally uh, from month to month some money to live. But uh, as a poet or writer, if you have a, a Renaissance interest, you're interested in everything around the world, it's a good thing. Yeah, I'm sure many aspiring writers will take solace in that fact. I did, uh, I studied liberal arts myself. So we introduced to, you know, things like art history, philosophy, anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that these things never go to waste. Uh, you know, going and seeing a ballet or going and seeing a dance show, all of these things never go to waste because they come into your creative process and you never know where they filter uh, down. It reminds me of uh, Steve Jobs' speech, you know, when he says that <laughs> connect the dots. So you can always connect the dots. Uh, your current job is very, very fascinating. I have never met anyone who is a, a playwright, dramaturge, and, you know, you have created one of the most successful circus performance plays in Hungary in the last 25 years. So uh, can, you, uh, can you shed some light on, you know, what is it like writing for circus performances versus writing plays in general? What, what is the difference and what's your process? Uh, there, is, uh, there is circus dramaturgy, normally. Every, every piece of uh, plays or every piece of the show business have some kind of dramaturgy, the choreographies, the acts, the, the numbering of the acts, but there, there is not exist a profession like circus dramaturg. I think we, we are two dozens in globally, two dozens, Cirque du Soleil, have some dramaturgists or playwright and uh, this uh, modern new circus groups, maybe with some texts or uh, uh, text writing for songs. Uh, exactly six years ago, there was a, there was a job opportunity. And uh, yes, as a child in the 80s, the previous century in the 1980s, I used to go to circus or the Capital Circus of Budapest with my grandparents. But uh, later I absolutely forgot all the circus things. And this was some, some funny opportunity to me because for that time, six years ago, I had, uh, I had worked for a university press as an editor. And the editor is uh, just sitting in a, a table and just uh, reading the text of others and ta -da -da, ta -da -da, ta -da -da. It's in a way, it's not boring, but in a way it's, it's a really closed work. And 
And I thought six years ago that, that opportunities could be uh, a nice experience of one or two weeks. I have my free days from, the, from work and let's make the English and Hungarian tax for the, for the International Circus Festival of Budapest, which is one of the, the greatest circus festival among Monte Carlo, Moscow, Latina in Italy, circus festivals. And uh, I, I have the thought, uh, if I will be a grandparent, it will be a great story for, for my grandchildren that your granddad had two weeks in a circus. That was the beginning. I just went in the, the building of the circus. There was a new director, Peter Fekete, new director and told me that just go and see the show. And later, uh, after the show, we have discussed about your, your intuitions, about your insights, everything. Yes, the show finished. I go to the director's room. He opened the bottle of Palinka. Palinka is the Hungarian spirit. Bottle of Palinka. Give a cup of Palinka. Schnitt. Early morning, three e uh, four a.m. We can we couldn't finish our discussion about the uh, uh, the uh, how to renew the circus, the whole circus. That was a quite quite a strange night, quite a strange experience. Then I started to work in the circus. That uh, piece of uh, the theme of the the title of that. Uh, that show with the most, most, most successful circus performance was the Children of Atlantis. As more than, uh, more than 2,000 visitors or spectators. And uh, also the, the famous Hollywoodian couple, Javier Bardem and his wife. Two, uh, two, uh, Oscar, two, two Hollywoodian actors with Oscars with their child. And uh, the other, other day, this couple, Javier Bailem and his wife, uh, came back to the circus because they, they would like to see once again our show. Wow, you certainly know how to tell a story and your uh, acting skills also have come Penelope out Cruz. Penelope Cruz, the... Oh, wow, that's amazing. That's it's really, really interesting. Um, and I'm sure it, you have some amazing stories to tell your grandkids now. Um, I'm also very interested, uh, you know, you, your latest short story, 8th District of God, it is about the most infamous uh, number eight district of Budapest, which is Hungary's biggest urban slum. Um, and your stories try and collect fragments of there. Um, and you have moved, you moved to that area in order to write this story. So I wanted to know more about, you know, your decision to do this. What kinds of themes were you looking for when you moved? Uh, what kind of stories were you hoping to capture? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, one part of my life is the, in the circus, success and glamour, <laughs> glamour. And uh, these mainly are, are shows for children. The, the most typical uh, uh, spectator of the circus is uh, children with grandparents. And I, I have some, some more interest to the other kind uh, of the world. And this, the origin of that, uh, of the A district of God, I moved there. I have some money. I, I, I bought my first small, really small apartment. I moved there and uh, this was, uh, the decade long, I, I think, anthropological or sociological journey into the dark side of the capital of Hungary, the dark side of Budapest, not the nightlife, but uh, is there a really strange, a multicultural part 
of Budapest because all the minorities or all the immigrants or minorities of immigrants have uh, flats or rentals there. For example, from Turkey, from China, from Afghanistan, from African countries, for uh, Muslim countries, uh, so many, so many gypsies, so many students there, because there are so many universities and uh, universities, uh, dormitories, and this multiculturalism. You have so many cultures in a small, uh, small territory have so many conflicts because the neighbors have, uh, have different cultural contexts and different traditions and different uh, way of thinking. And uh, I, I moved the middle of that uh, multicultural area and I just, uh, I just collected so many pieces, so many stories, so many life stories. I made so many interviews. And uh, finally, it started on Facebook and social media. Then have a, a daily newspaper interested in, and I have a series in a da daily newspaper. Uh, later, I had one book, then another book, more than 600 pages. Then uh, two, two plays on theaters and the play, two plays in radio stations. And yes. So this is an area and, uh, that's really and, uh, interested you. This, these two books have been translated into six or seven languages. It's kind of success. And yes, uh, I'm how sure there's there's no other sort of anthropological study uh, you know on this area as you said by being a fly on the wall you were able to capture uh, you know and you, you may have, not have, you been have read read the stories and if you yeah. you can understand the stories it worked yes I, no I it was you... and I, I did enjoy you know the sense of place especially that that you evoked uh, for me that was the most visceral part of it um, you know, and it did seem like uh, fragments of different sort of cultures coming together. So I think you did achieve what you set out to pretty well. <laughs> my my uh, focus of or technique or uh, yes, my focus of my writing was the humanity, because every every character ha have. Um, their own uh, point of view, and every point of view is true. I'm not a judge. Right. I'm just a writer. I just uh, 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 contemplate them. Right. And if, if they have a conflict with each other, uh, a true point of view against a true point of view, a true tradition, against the true tradition and never judge. Every, every piece and the two books uh, have this uh, un, un, unwritten message that uh, every people have their values and have their trust and never judge them from the outside. That does- Just uh, watch them, watch yeah. them and, uh, and understand them and never judge. That does this moral, show, you know, moral it, judgment I, I do not like. It does writer. show in the writing because it, it does feel like, you know, you're very much an observer, spectator, sort of fly on the wall, kind of transmuting these experiences mm -hmm. onto paper, um, which is very, very fascinating uh, that you didn't let, you know, your own narrative voice interfere too much. Um, I also want to ask, you know, what advice would you give at what you did was a very, you know, courageous thing to do, which was to spend 10 years on this sort of a project. So what advice would you give aspiring writers who also want to capture a place as well as you did? Because the atmosphere that you evoked in your writing uh, was very, very real. So what advice can you give writers who want to do the same? Advice. Don't do it. <laughs> do not do it. 
I, I, I was a teacher at, uh, at uh, university, a creative writing teacher. And uh, there were so many young talents. Uh, and I told them uh, that you have to go deep. I told them as a writer, if you would like to write something new, something extraordinary, something really, really interesting, go, go really, really deep. But the way I, I do not know what is your way, but uh, I, I have no recipe how to cook. I can tell you that uh, when you cook, is good or bad, but I don't know uh, what, uh, what food do you like to make and what's the way uh, to reach that food. Uh, I can help you with the salt and pepper and paprika and uh, all the spices. I can tell you that uh, that sentence is not stylistically not good or not bad. And, but as an older or elder man, or as a teacher, I don't want to give you an advice that uh, the repeat this, uh, this my way into the suburb or into the slum or into the hell of the soul, because uh, I, I have, as, as I wrote in my poem, I had this uh, relation, I have a wife, later I have this, my second wife, and these were really tragic stories. But how can I tell a young, uh, I don't know, 24, 23 year old, young university creative writing student, that, yes, have a wife or a husband, then break up. And have, have your hell inside. No, uh, not an advice. Uh, and just be, be curious, open your eyes and don't, don't repeat the things. You have to, you have to discover the subject and you have to discover, uh, have to discover how can you write perfectly. And there are so many stories all around the world, family stories, stories on the roads, uh, absolutely fictionalist stories, or, uh, imagined stories. And uh, to be a writer is uh, not the storytelling, but the way how you tell the story. The most, uh, most boring story could be interesting, when you are a good writer. For example, Franz Kafka. It's a story about bureaucracy. Yes, the castle and uh, the other Kafkaian stories. It's about bureaucracy, but how it was written, it made them a super beautiful literature. Or my, one of my favorite Portuguese writers, the Nobel Prize winner, José Saramago, is the as a, a Roman of him, and I think the English title is "The Journey of an Elephant." It's uh, it's two hundred pages about an elephant who has a journey from from Rome, I think, from Rome to Lisbon in the Middle Ages. Yes, it's a really interesting story. No how an elephant go from a European city to an other centuries ago. But how it was written, the talent, the super talent of Jose Saramago made that, that non-story a beautiful literature. I couldn't agree with you, uh, with you more. So I interview, I interview a lot of writers for my podcast. Um, you know, and it's it's so interesting to find out what doesn't go into the book uh, because there is so much work, there is so much research, there's so much thinking 
that you know remains off the page but that's the basis of what actually you know goes in and it, the the saying tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. is really very very true uh, because what we see is just such such a small part of what goes into the creative process um so you were an editor at one of the biggest university publishing houses and you've been an editor at a lit magazine among other platforms so i wanted to ask you a little bit more about what kind of writing and stories are we seeing coming out of hungary today uh mainly in from hungary yes uh, uh some years ago we have uh, the subject as uh, uh all the other countries uh, from the Eastern Bloc, from the Eastern Communist Bloc. And uh, many writers of the generation wrote the story of their parents or the relation with their parents, because uh, uh, from the actors uh, of the, how can I say, the, the agents of, of the dictatorship, and this was a high thing. And when the when the archives and the archives opened, they have they had uh, they knew that their parents were agents of the dictatorship, and that feeling that Gazant will be the, the generation of uh, a basic uh, subject of a generation. These years after the trauma or traumatic uh, feeling of the generation, these years, we have a really strong uh, wave of uh, especially women, uh, women writers, they wrote uh, crime stories. And really good crime stories. Uh, and uh, yes, that is what is really interesting because five years ago, we, we have just one or two contemporary crime novels or crime fiction. And nowadays, we have more than, uh, more than a dozen uh, crime story or crime fiction writers. Just a few years were enough to, to uh, to uh, birth of a generation without any uh, without any kind of uh, antecedents. That's very interesting because you know trends do come in waves. Um, and your story about a generation coping with trauma reminded me of the copious amounts of partition literature that we have right now in India. Uh, because mm -hmm. that was the trauma that our grandparents went through. And there's a big push right now to sort of memorialize these stories before they get lost. Uh, so we are seeing a lot of that as well. And, and we are also seeing uh, mm -hmm. lots of women writers and, you know, women characters like never before. So that that's a that's quite a very nice thing to see in a society like ours. Um, and, and as a reader, it's really, really exciting to read. I'm really happy that there are some more uh, girls and women in every generation uh, started writing, started writing their uh, stories from their point of view. As a, as a man writer, I'm really interested in the female voices or techniques. Absolutely. Absolutely, and the kinds of the, the kinds of characters that are coming out uh, are perhaps you know uh, something that we wouldn't have seen before. So I want to ask you, since you are such a prolific writer and you wear so many hats, uh, I, and I love the story of you know you writing the poem on the bus. Uh, so what is your <laughs> writing routine? Uh I don't have, normally I don't have a writing routine. There are two kinds of writing. One of um, uh, is a professional writing and the other 
other one is the artistical writing. I have many tasks to do. For example, next Saturday, we have a new circus show. We have a premiere, oh, not Saturday, Friday. Friday night, we have a new premiere, a Christmas show in the circus. And it's a, and it's a task for me. I have to write. Or in other case, as, as a, a journalist or as, this is a profession, I have a task and then have an agreement and have a deadline and have to write a story or a piece of, uh, of uh, circus show or circus play. And it's, it's have a normal routine, wake up at the morning, go for a walking with my dog, then started working on the text or on, on the text of a song or just the scenes or characters of a circus show. I, I have made, I think, 25, 26 circus shows in these six years time. And I have the, I, the, the, not the routines, but I have the techniques to make it. I have a concentrate on the time then this is a group working process, and uh, this is a great, um, great uh, creative work to make shows. And I know everything, how it works, how it will work with the musicians, with the main characters, with the artists. The other thing, the artistic of writing of my short stories, my novels, of my poetry is, uh, is, uh, Absolutely depends on inspiration. I have, I have something, uh, or I find something on the road. I have a, a dream at night, or I don't know. It's it, it not have a routine. I I used to used to write books or poetry or short stories. Um, by chance, by random. That's quite interesting, you know, because some writers uh, say that they sort of force themselves to write 200 words a day, while others say that, you know, it's when inspiration strikes. Um, it reminds me also, you know, the doing creative work for work is so uh -huh. different from doing creative work for fun, you know, because I'm an editor, so I edit books, so I read for a living. Uh -huh. Uh, so people always ask me, you know, how do you manage to read for a living and then read for fun? But when I'm uh -huh. working, you know, as an editor, when I'm editing a book, that is a very different mind space that you enter uh, versus when you're off work, you know, it's still mm -hmm. a profession. So I yes. like that you said that. Yes, uh, I, I have an, I have even have an advice for all the, all the writers. Learn how to type with 10 fingers really <laughs> fast. If you have an idea, but have just 10 minutes to write, you can write the whole page in the 10 minutes. That it's is really most... sad to see the colleagues with two fingers <laughs> and uh, the passion to have to write, but uh, the 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 lack of the ability of writing or use a pen and have a notebook but typing with that fingers is is a great success of uh of uh, be a writer in this in these times when you have so much work so much intention so much impressions all around the world you have to have to use the 10 minutes or hours after walking, yes, when you have clear mind to write, but these, or when you have a child or, or uh, uh, two or three children, it's uh, so much harder to have these 10 minutes of time of writing. Yes. I think that's one of the most unique and useful uh, pieces of <laughs> advice that I have heard for I writers. Think we think <laughs> <laughs> I'm very pragmatic. pragmatic. Um, so I also want to speak about your interest in languages. Um, I've always wanted to learn more languages. I learned French, but I forgot it because I couldn't practice it. But you have, you know, even translated into many languages, including Portuguese, Arabic, French. You've given lectures in Spanish, English, Hungarian. 
so you know how did you learn all of these new languages how long did it take you to get proficient and how do you how do you keep updated how do you keep them in your memory and keep refreshing yourself because it it's a lot i i i just uh, uh i was learning arabic for two years but i, I can't speak or <laughs> it's uh it was just an experiment for me uh, all the others um uh, english i learned english uh, in my country after the russian after the change of dictatorship into democracy uh, you had to choose from german or english my parents told me I was six years old or seven years old, but English is better. Oh, thank you. <laughs> English is better. Uh, then uh, in the secondary school, uh, in the high school, I learned ancient Latin for 10 years. I started ancient Latin and uh, ancient Greek in the university for two years. And after the basics of Latin, uh, it's it's not really simple, but much more simply, uh, uh, much more simple uh, to learn now Latin languages, just like French or Spanish or Portuguese. It's the, the logic of the languages yeah. are really similar to each other. Correct, correct, yeah. Okay, that brings us to the end of the session. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, very, very interesting insights. Very uh, straightforward, useful. Uh, really gave me an insight into more of your work, um, into something I wasn't aware of. So thank you so much. I really enjoyed reading your uh, collection of short stories. Uh, so, you know, uh, everybody, please check it out. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your kind invitation and all the all the work of you and everything. Have a nice festival time. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank and, you. Uh, Good conversation. <laughs> and um, thank you, List Institute Hungarian Culture Center Delhi, for getting Daniel on board for this festival. <laughs>